Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, we are here, we are Jirki Pulianian, uh, which uh, works at um, Spotify and builds the content pipeline. And, okay, and the show is yours. Thanks. Uh, yeah, as told, I'm uh, working on a content pipeline. So, content for this, uh, pun not intended, uh, talk is to talk about how we actually take all the data from labels and what do we do it and what kind of problems we have met in there, uh, where do we use Python and where we don't use Python, why we don't use Python somewhere and uh, like the overall, I hope this will give you answers to the questions that why we do certain things and why, why, we ch why you might want to uh, like a uh, use the same kind of tools as we do too. But uh, short words about me, as told. Uh, my name is Jyrki Pulliainen. I actually come from Finland and I've been working for Spotify in the content team since January. Uh, so I'm pretty new in the company, but because we're onboarding people like, like uh, enormous amounts of people there, it's, I'm becoming a senior developer any day now. And I've been using Python since 2.3, so I'm, you could probably say that I'm pretty new in that one too, depends on how you view it. And if you want to reach out to me, uh, I will be here, probably standing on, uh, on the Spotify stand, or you can use my Twitter handle for just ping me if you have something to ask. Uh, great. Uh, who here does not know what Spotify is? Oh, uh, Spotify is a music streaming service, so uh, we built a service that actually has been around, as we started doing it in 2006, it became in the public beta in 2008, and it's been, it's a music streaming service for, uh, for including uh, all major labels, uh, uh, most of the indie labels, and uh, so practically including all the world's music and it's made for the, it's a streaming service so you can play music through it, you can create playlists, you can interact with other people and so forth. And for doing this we have our own custom built client. You can see like some social interactions and play buttons and searches and stuff like that. We also come in the mobile so you can stream stuff, stuff on your mobile. This is from the Android app. and. Uh, in the numbers, uh, we currently have 10 million monthly active users, so actual people playing a song at least once a month. Uh, and they have a selection of 18 million tracks here in Europe. Uh, states is about 16 million, so we have like a slight regional, regional differences on what you can actually play, but in the Europe you have the selection of 18 million tracks. And that actually told us to something 100 years of music, might be even more nowadays, like 125 years of music. So if you're really into listening music, just start with searching with A and hit play and see what comes up. Uh, and we keep adding about 20,000 tracks a day. So that's actually the part where I work in. I, I will be taking them uh, into the music pipeline and adding them. So, how does our music pipeline then look like? I, I always want to say that our music pipeline is the anti-hipster stack. We don't have any new fancy cool stuff like uh, we don't go with MongoDB, we don't pour in the fanciest NoSQL or MemSQL or whatever like top of the line product. We actually start this thing by working with uh, our partners, the labels, uh, this is like actually the only three label logos I found that had a license that I could actually put them on the, uh, on the slides. So uh, that's like, a, that's where we start with and they, our, we get hourly delivers from them to our storage that usually is like secure FTP even plain FTP with a password, so it's 
nice, uh, nice and secure. And then some mis some labels have like a huge jar file that they deliver to us, and then we run it, and then it populates our disks with stuff. And uh, once we get that into the storage, uh, we we ingest it. We call the process with the name of ingestion. That's reading the data from labels and then splitting up to our databases, which actually are Postgres. So we use Postgres heavily in uh, music pipelining. And after we have added all this stuff into the, we have like a one database per, per label, then we do a gigantic merge operation, smash it all together to an even bigger database that will contain all music from all labels. And we actually use that particular database for uh, building the uh, indices for the service. In addition to this, we also need to transcode all the stuff that comes from the label. So we get raw audio, and we want to transcode it to our format. Now, of, of this whole picture, the anti-hipster stack starts at the very beginning. We actually get XML. Uh, really, really nice and lovely XML from the labels, and we get uh, loads of it. So uh, I will come back to that later, what, what I mean by loads of the XML, but we get, uh, the deliver we call them deliveries when the label sends us new content. So new content, uh, new updates to old content, the like takedowns that they want to take down something, it's all XML, and it's not anything standardized. And the audio, some labels are actually sending flag for us. And even the major ones are slightly going towards the flag mo mode. But most of the audio we get is it's Windows Media Audio lossless. And because of our transcoding cluster running Linux boxes with mPlayer, uh, it's, I would say the Windows Media Audio losses is not probably the, the, not the best input for those machines or those, that configuration. And once we're done with the uh, transcoding, we actually output OG files, encrypted OG files in very, various bit rates for the streaming service, and then we have encrypted MP3s for download service. So yeah, we actually have a download service. If you have, if you didn't know that one, you can actually download and buy songs from our uh, app. Uh, some numbers, we currently total somewhere in over 500 terabytes of raw data, including all, it's of course it's mostly audio, but then it has like uh, uh, cover arts and loads of XML in there. Uh, we get, the last peak was like 8,000 to 9, 8, over 8,000 uh, new deliveries, so updates to existing data, uh, new, new stuff, and deletions, about eight to 9,000 every day uh, from different labels. And the 20,000 new tracks is of course a part of it, but then we have like, uh, that's about like one fourth of the whole stuff we get because we get like a daily updates to, yeah, we want to, this album to go live in New Zealand or something like that. And then the greatest part is that we get malformed data every day. So depending on, uh, it might be some, uh, like a transfer from the labels that was cut off and we got some malformed uh, audio file or they have bad headers or the XML is broken or, or they didn't really understand the spec or we communicated the spec badly to them and then we get like, uh, on a day-to-day basis, we get situations where we uh, end up working with malformed data and, uh, and figuring out why is this song not live. Oh, it actually the f header of the flag file says that this has 70, 17 uh, million uh, tag, ID3 tags in it. And then we have some mutagen called li library in Python that tries to read it and it's like, oh, 70 million tags. I'll just use this range not X range in the for loop, and then it fills up the memory and the whole transcoding uh, process goes down. So yeah, we get these interesting problems and we need to make our tools robust uh, in that sense. And for that one, uh, 
I like the mantra of right tools for the right job. I have the PHP, the infamous PHP hammer there, but I'm not going to hopefully bash the PHP because we actually use PHP in our system. We have our content catalog management, which is meant for people working with labels and for labels to see the deliveries. That's actually written in PHP. And then you might ask, well, why? Why not Python? Uh, that's because we, as a company, the Spotify, all like websites and stuff are already in PHP. So we have a load of ready-made components. So we can just take those and for logins and stuff like that so that we don't have to build everything from ground up. Plus, we have a really, really talented web devs so, who work with the PHP. And I myself have worked with web for six or seven years before joining this company. I would rather not go back there. And so, in the right tool for the right job, for XML, uh, we actually use XSLT. So we use uh, style sheet transforms to, when we get the label specific XML, we transform it to our internal format in memory and uh, with the help of XSLT and then XPath extensions before ingesting it to our databases. The, if you don't know the XPath extensions, they are like, uh, let's see, who knows, who has written XSLT here? I'm sorry for you guys. Uh, the XPath extensions are actually really neat because at one point you struggle with the templates in XSLT and you're like, how am I going to write this? But you can use, uh, this is an example of using XS, XPath extensions with uh, LXML. So you can actually write a Python function doing that. Thing. So here we have a function called form, formulify, which you can pass the artist name, and then it outputs the artist formerly known as the name. And if you pass prints to it, and it outputs prints. So we use this one to cut down in the development time. We still want to use XLT because in, uh, in a bizarre way, it's kind of a match made in standardizing organizations. It works pretty well in XML, but every now and then it's not, no point of using the extra time to figure out the XLT quirks to make it work. So we write some stuff in these extensions, even though they might be slightly slower to apply on your XML. But yeah, it seems to work pretty well. Uh, in regards of the uh, XML, I can, because I talked about malform deliveries and funky deliveries, I can share some fun facts. Uh, we have 10 different XML formats. So there's one uh, that's industry standard called Digital De Delivery Exchange XML or something, DDEX. And that's uh, built by taking all the possible formats from all the major labels, gluing them together and making it still possible for all of them to deliver in this standardized format, but slightly different. So we had to battle with uh, over 10 different XML formats. Yeah. Uh, so there's the major one, and then we have our own format, which we prefer with Indies. So the, we have like a really simplified format for delivering data that we sent to Indies and hope that they use it. And yeah, the one industry standard. Uh, the biggest XML file so far we have met is 3.3 million lines. That was actually valid uh, a valid album. I thought I think it was like uh, one labels all music ever published in Germany or something like that. It was an enormous. To just to compare the 350 megabyte 3.3 million uh, line XML, the Bible actually fits into three megabytes. So. Yeah, you get the idea of, uh, of the size of the stuff that we have to battle here. But to battle with it, we actually use LXML, and uh, we have found it to be really, really good tool. Uh, I run uh, some performance tests on the huge XML file. So on the top, you can see the LXML performance. So actually parsing the, three point, uh, the 350 megabyte XML only takes like a 2.3 seconds on the LXML, depending on your setup. That was actually run on this laptop. So we get a bit more beefier service. It should be faster there. Uh, even the C element tree from the XML, the standard library XML library, performs pretty well. The, the Python version uh, got ohm killed after running in eight minutes. So 
uh, there's a reason why don't, we don't really use that one. And I have 8 gigabytes of memory, so I don't know what it's doing. It might also be the 2.7, the Debian ships that has problems, but I doubt. And I, for, just for the giggles, I ran it with PyPy, and it manages to do like a 30 point, a 33.2 seconds for the same file. That's not bad, but we are still talking about order of magnitude between LXML and PyPy. Then, uh, once this whole ingestion process of eating the XML and spitting it out of our, uh, our per label databases is done, we go to the process of merging. Uh, the merging, as I told you, means that we pick up all the music from all the labels, combine it together, and then build like the whole catalog of our music, like a big database representing our whole catalog out of it. Uh, traditionally, there's like a two approaches you can do this merging. You can do it more manual way, which means that you have to have labor to do it, like, uh, like actual people going through it and fixing errors that probably would produce better results, but it's not really a viable option. Or then you can go the fully automated way that you just trust what comes in. And the problem with you just trust what comes in is that usually you can't trust the stuff that gets in. Like for example, we, in addition to the label stuff, we use external databases like All Music Guide to get artist portraits and music brains and such to get like bi uh, biographies and all the metadata to the artists. Even those can be faulty. So we kind of use like this automated process, but then we have manual creation of the errors, errors of people actually seeing on the like a, going to the customer, like a community responses that, hey, my favorite art is broken, and then like actually changing that one. Uh, this also has a lo some interesting fun facts. Uh, for the automated process, there's no specific uh, artist ID or anything that could even, in, not even, uh, None of the labels, ha I, I know that they have the, uh, some ID, but they never send it out. There's a discussion going in the industry that, yeah, we should start giving like a unique IDs per, uh, for artists and so that you can actually say that these two are the same artists. Well, this, of course, creates a nice problem when you have multiple artists with the same name. Like the guy Prince, not only that he has multiple different names, that's a problem in, uh, in itself already, but we have multiple different artists called Prince. And those who know Swedish music, we have artists called Kent uh, in Sweden. Uh, but he's also available in, uh, in Turkey and in France, and they are not the same guy. So yeah, and the, the name is the only identifier we actually have for the artist. And uh, yeah, in addition to that, spelling differs, like R-E-M. Will you write it with R-E-M without dots, D-R-E-M, uh, R-E-M with dots, or without the D, or D, comma, R-E-M, R-E-M, comma, D, you know, and you get all this. It's, it's like uh, inside from one label that you get this data, which probably for historical reasons is not correct, uh, because it's been manually entered, and whoever has thought how you write the artist's name, it kind of differs, so this causes us a little uh, problems. For example, if you have access to the service, you can, I think, one problem there currently that I saw like a few days ago is that the Beastie Boys, we have Beastie Boys and then we have the Beastie Boys and they are currently two different artists. We have a mechanism for manually merging these cases. And then the other fun thing is that we get multiple versions of the same album. You get one album for U.S. market, for example, and then you get one mar album for European market. The music data in those is to byte to byte the actual same data, but they are two different albums, and we have to keep track of them, and we can't just merge them because there might be some different licensor in some point that needs to get paid for when you play the U.S. version than when you play the European version. And then you get all, oops, sorry, and then you get all the uh, deluxe edition, non-explicit lyrics, explicit lyrics, 
digital remaster that's basically about the same, but they, they decided to throw a bunch of B-side of the singles in the mix who no one ever listens to. And yeah, so we have some of these problems. And all this combined also combined, it creates an enormous search base when you want to do, when you want to uh, see that if this artist publishes, if your artist called Kent publishes a new album, you can't just, you know, take all the artists and see where it would be best fit. This uh, kind of uh, creates a huge search space for the problem. Uh, for in, in terms of tracks, it's, if you would just do like a dummy matching, it's a squad, like an order, order of two problem in the terms of the track now, uh, amount. But uh, for the insufficient and data, we actually use machine learning to solve problems. We have had a, we had a an thesis worker for this spring that actually solved the uh, the way you can call it solved, but solved really well the problem of getting artists with different names using machine machine learning to match like different attributes of the artist. What's the language? Uh, how many? This they have, what's the country that they, they publish the music in and stuff like that. Like using features from artists actually deciding that now this one artist is actually two different artists. Now we have a, so now we have a mechanism where we can run a batch job through all the artists and flag or uh, ambiguous artists that should be manually split. And it also includes like a part where we get new music. We can actually have a score for artists and decide that, hey, this is probably best fit for the Swedish camp, not the Turkish one. That's because the, it seems like the song names are in the Swedish. Uh, and there's some like uh, things we have experimented. Uh, this works surprisingly fine. This is a like a nice pro tip. Just remove all funky Unicode stuff from the names and pick the fifth character. That is, if your name is if the artist's name is over five characters, that's a uh, oh, sorry, the six character. It's a pretty well like uh, reducing search space and actually finding the combination it seems to be this is kind of bizarre world. The like uh, simple tricks like these seem to work really well for reducing search space. And we do most levels and distance to find out the artist names or uh, or other string uh, like edit distances that and they tend to be slow to do that stuff. I have been, we, and we use C extension pipeline heavily. But uh, if you're interested about this machine learning stuff, we have the, you can shoot more questions about it. I'm probably not the best person to uh, reply to them, but go ahead. There are other people here too who might chip in. Uh, and for the database part, for the, when we actually get it, uh, get the data into the database, we use Postgres and there's a, uh, really good relation, uh, reason for that one. We are, our data is heavily relational. So you have label that has artists and you have the artists have albums and uh, you can see the relational patterns. You could probably go with some uh, other solution but we have been using Postgres from the day one and it's still working really well. There are some tips in uh, using it is that you don't want to over uh, over normalize it. Uh, it's, we've seen that it's really beneficial to go all in with like uh, BCNF or even we tend to break the third normal form every now and then because uh, just adding like uh, uh, adding more indices is not really worth it if you can tend up to have funky composite keys and intermediate tables to enable your third normal form. Sometimes it just makes sense to copy the artist name everywhere and then just know where it's copied when you update the data. You remember to update all these parts. Uh, and if you keep on adding indices, eventually we run out, out of memory and then it just becomes slower and slower. So we have done some changes in the past, like the artist name that we started denormalizing it to make the Postgres behave better when indexing. And uh, kind of contrary to the previous point, uh, when you use relational database, actually use the use joins, use, use the 
uh, like uh, don't use sub queries that much. Pre prefer the ways where the actual query planner for the database. That's what we found, found, have found out that if you let the heavy lifting go into the Postgres because it's a pretty powerful database that actually that you don't build so much logic of getting the data in your application, but you trust that uh, if you just pass uh, implicit join the Postgres, you can just trust it to do correctly. The query planner is actually a really good friend and it usually ends up in a really, really good uh, result of and the speed of how to actually fetch your data from the Postgres. So now we have reached the point of getting the XML, transforming the XML to the source database and merging that all together in the one huge Postgres instance. So what happens to the audio then? Uh, the VML losses we actually get goes to our transcoding cluster. And uh, the whole thing is uh, asynchronous. Uh, so yeah, that, that's the one hipster part. We do asynchronous transcoding of the stuff. So we actually pass them to RabbitMQ. Uh, the system was written before Celery came out, so that's why it's used the AMQ BLIP. It works pretty well. So we have a RabbitMQ-based uh, worker queue where we, when we get new audio, we throw uh, new jobs in the, in the queue that please transcode this. And then we have like priority queues. The ads go in the top priority queue because the ad people want to see their ads immediately. And then the music goes in the medium priority queue. And I think cover outs fall in the lowest one because if you can play the music, it doesn't really matter if you can see the cover art or not. And the whole setup is currently one master and 49 slaves. So one master is orchestrating stuff by, with, by, with the ingestion process. So the ingestion process sends to the master that he has a new job, and then the master splits it to the different priority queues. And for the back end of the whole transcoding system, we just switched to Isilon, which is a commercial product. And it's... It's amazing. It has like an eight gigabit throughput. Throughput. So the the SRE guys, actually the ops guys, actually added more network interface cards to our transcoding boxes because we couldn't utilize the whole Isilon speed. It's like a distributed high performance storage. So we can actually get eight gigabit throughput from there, and that means that we can do one million transcodings of audio per day. Uh, that has actually led to problems where people in working in ad sales upload a new ad and if they don't see it available in 30 seconds they call us like what's wrong with your system and we're like you know there might be some other audio that takes precedence over your ad but it usually works so fast that we upload this and then we see it available right away because the whole transcoding process work, works like a, a snapping your finger uh, it's like a snapping your fingers once you have uploaded the audio uh, and this also means uh, that doing the one million per day means that we can actually retranscode our whole catalog of 18 million songs in about a month. That's still a long time, but it's because we have to do like four different transcodings for every track, but that's still a pretty amazing uh, amount of data go going through in there. So, and the moment we get the audio out, we go with the we have like a set of features we want to have. We want to have the uh, cover art, and then we want to have the most commonly used audio, which is the 160 kilobyte OG available. Uh, and once we get those out of the stuff, then the, uh, then the actual album is uh, eligible to go into the index. And then we do index building every day uh, during the night. And for index building, uh, we actually use Java. Uh, the reason why, it, it used to be Python, but we found out that Python in actual sheer computing power was not enough, uh, was not fast enough for building the indices. So we used to do three index indices or index releases per week way back because the building of the whole indexes and merging all this stuff took so long time with Python that uh, it only managed to produce like uh, three indexes per week. Now we switch to Java. 
well, of course, we used Lucene for the search, so it's a natural choice there. But now we switch to Java, and we can see like the indexing machine going 100% with all 16 cores, and the thing is done in a few hours to build like build the whole complete index, not anything like uh, here's a patch set for our index, but we actually built the whole complete index every single day. And for me, I would like to. I've been poking around a lot of stuff with Pipeline, our backend, uh, in the content pipeline. I would like to actually revert back to the Python times and maybe try PyPy, but I probably don't have the time on my hack days to do that because I have a, like a bunch of other projects in the line too. So once we've done with the index building, we come to the next point, which is the music distribution. We currently have around 1,500 servers in three different data centers. Out of those 1,500, uh, like, uh, I think like 140 is used for serving all the indices. So for search indices, we think, I think we have like a 20 boxes per site. Uh, then we have a few boxes for encryption keys so that your player can fetch the encryption key and play the song. Then we have what we call as the browse index. So when an artist page, you can see all the Lay all the albums the artists have. And uh, then there's a few others like downloads and top list and stuff like that. So we are actually responsible for the index building, uh, index distribution part too. As I told you, the time to live for stuff is currently one day. So when we get stuff uh, from the labels, new deliveries, new products, we can promise them that this will go live the next day. Uh, we have also built a fast track for doing like small patches, but we don't yet want to go with all this patching stuff because then you would have to start thinking of something a bit more like uh, sophisticated data, data systems on the production sites. Uh, the current index building thing is that uh, process that we have one box in Stockholm that builds the indices and then it pushes it to you can view this as a one site, like let's say this is the London site, we have one in Ashburn. Too. So it pushes all this 140 gigabytes of indices every day to the one box in there, then, uh, which is like an intermediate host on the site. Then we have these, these copy stuff together, and even further they push them to the production services. And this is probably the bottleneck of our stuff at the moment. This whole copying 140 gigabytes over because it's done in SCPing the host directly. It takes uh, a lot of time. I would say like, uh, depending on how the network works, it's like uh, six to nine hours might even be there just moving stuff around. Once the stuff is in place, it's pretty easy. Then we just signal the services that, hey, you have a new index, please lock this in memory uh, and restart yourself or reload the index depending on the service. But for the fix this one, we're actually moving towards BitTorrent in the future. So we're now experimenting with uh, copying stuff with BitTorrent around. And what that means is that the current system where we SCP 140 gigab gigabytes to one machine and then distribute it with the intermediate host and then go with the production host with the BitTorrent when all of those are actually uh, leaching the BitTorrent stream, we can actually, the moment we have up, uploaded the whole 140 gigabytes to, let's say, Ashburn, it already has copied to every other machine in there. So that's a cutting, like, uh, I think currently we are estimating three, four hours of our index distribution time away just by switching to BitTorrent. But the cool, not so cool thing with BitTorrent that it's not totally free of issues. Uh, for some reason, the software available for BitTorrent use is not really fit for our use cases. Uh, one thing is that it has really crappy encryption. It's like 60-bit encryption that's only function is to make it look like something else than BitTorrent in your ISP logs when you download the latest episode of Dexter. And that's not really well fit for us, which means that we have to run the whole thing through an IPsec tunnel, which means that we have to upgrade firewalls to, to get new firewalls to uh, have the full power of the, to be able to use the whole bandwidth uh, of moving stuff. Then every BitTorrent tracker seemed to be somewhat 
uh, pro hmm? because we don't want to leak stuff we move stuff like uh, upcoming releases of albums before they actually come alive to the service so yeah the question question was why do we want to encrypt it uh, so we want don't want to leak the stuff uh, and we don't want to leak stuff from the indices and, and also that we're moving between sites like data centers yeah we're going on a public network over interwebs and so we're now wrapping the whole thing in a IPsec to make it like uh, transparent for us to use and uh, to be secure enough and uh, then the tracker they are more suitable for finding the newest episode of Dexter they're not really suitable for controlling this kind of thing so we ended up writing our own tracker the clients are mostly also suitable for finding the newest episode of uh, Dexter the most promising was the transmission command line interface the transmission is the Linux client written in Python but the one that DPN offers was written kind of badly and we didn't want to backport the newer one so it was that slow so we just took the libtorrent Python wrapper and uh, wrote the, like a seven lines of Python code for our own torrent client. So we basically have our own torrenting infrastructure at the moment in, uh, in place. So the stuff that we actually use, the, what's the stuff that we actually move? Uh, we use Lucene for search, but for everything else we use really dummy read-only key, uh, key, uh, key value indices. So we use Tokyo cabinet mostly uh, in the services. Then we have one internal key value store. Uh, that, but that's, uh, the reason to do this is actually because we write them once on the indexing machines and then we just load, move the whole chunk to the production machines, load it in their memory and only read it there. And it's also that easy for up, upgrading, uh, updating stuff. So at the, when you don't have to worry about, oh, I got this new album, I should probably remove it from these nodes in the servers. You can just, you know, I got this new album here, have a 16 gigabyte chunk and load it in the memory and run it. And it's like it makes the whole uh, uh, pipeline so much simpler when you don't have to worry about the state of the indices on the production machines because you know that they are based on this very binary blob that you have on your disk locally too. Now this doesn't of course work in terms of uh, like you're getting fast updates so we have built uh, a second part to this which we call incremental updates. It's like a fast lane of updates. So someone uploads Let's say we get a new content that is not uh, legal in some countries we're in, like uh, Nazi content, uh, neo-Nazi content in Germany. And then we're, uh, we have to take it down to comply the law. And so for that one, we have like a fast lane update where we build the diffs uh, uh, of our indices and send the diffs to the server to make like patches. But even for this process, we always, even if we would do multiple uh, diffs a day, we always combine them to be a single patch, send them up there and tell the service to apply the patch to the, to the uh, original index file. So we want to avoid the like, uh, unknown states on the production message to the last point. And it's actually working really well in uh, terms of the data that we use and we're currently talking about should we switch to only send weekly full indices and then just apply patches on top of them. Uh, for yeah, that's about it. Uh, for the remarks of the for what to do in the future, uh, the whole thing is kind of complicated. It has multiple parts. So one thing that you really want to do is to keep eye on it. So you want to know how long it does take you to move data to certain servers. You want to know if you're moving indices bigger than you can actually fit into the memory on a machine. We are currently to hit that limit, but we have hit like a limit of having half of the memory, uh, like a 16 gigabyte memory, uh, 16 gigabyte index on a machine with 32 gigabytes of memory. Effic and like uploading the second in index there, getting in the file, 
the page cache of Linux kernel, and then it uh, starts to throwing out the old index. And yeah, you, you see this all kind of weird behavior. And the only way, only way to find them out usually is to keep eye on it. So have statistics for your service latencies and stuff like that. Uh, and also, the big thing is to think about the speed. If the PyPy can parse to through 3.3 million lines XML uh, in 23 seconds, and then you get 20,000 of those or 10,000 of those a day, it kind of adds up. So you probably want to take the less elegant solution of throwing LXML in there and doing it in a two second time. You also, but you don't want to over optimize also it's kind of a balancing between the oh yeah if I, it's more like i can cut seconds out of this i should do this but it's not like going for the sub you can optimization because we're we're after all we are like a pipeline with a lot of patch jobs and it's it doesn't matter that much if we take a minute longer there or there but you don't want to start like incrementally increasing the time you spent because then it will bite you uh, eventually, in the end, when the amount of content increases. And you also want to experiment a lot, like the BitTorrent stuff. So start figuring out, like uh, pick up something new, see how it works, run parallel tests, do, if, you use, if it's a production service, it'll run a dark loading on it, switch the employees to use it for a while, see how things go, build new stuff and Try experimenting it and prepare to, uh, to throw it away if the experiment is not successful. Of course, if you keep on experimenting and always throwing stuff away, that's not a good thing too. So kind of try to keep something. And like eventually, ditch your code at some point, even if it would be how pretty in-house built, custom built BitTorrent tracker and BitTorrent client, maybe someday someone comes up with something better and then you should not your code and love it and treat it as your, as your little baby. You should actually ditch your code and switch for the better one. So, yeah. I still have like three minutes of time. So, thank you. There's a... We have a collaborative playlist for the event if you want to... If you use Spotify and want to throw music and want to hear what other people in the event uh, listen, so go for the spotify.fi slash EP underscore 2012. We have a question here. Or maybe two questions. One, um, so you touched on when you have uh, an artist that actually has inconsistent names. Yeah. I think there are some artists who do that deliberately as a sort of an artistic statement. And it doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, what do you do in that case? Do you just pick one arbitrarily? Uh, we kind of one one thing is that we kind of build like fuzzy names for the artists, so can we can find like like uh, if they have multiple different names, we might find like one common fuzzy name to them. And uh, the current logic is just to pick the one that we had seen first. So the oldest artist in our database. If we can't really figure out where this should go, then we just pick up the oldest one. We're now switching to if we to a system where we have multi if we have multiple hits for the this could be fit for these artists, maybe with even the same names. We now are switching to running uh, like a feature-based machine learning on the artist to see which one gets the highest score and then assign the track there. And that seems to work pretty well. And uh, does Spotify ever deal with physical CDs or is it always the data being sent by the, the labels like that? Yeah, we have dealt with the f physical stuff. Like, uh, we like uh, the amount of data with the labels they have and the state of their internet connection or something else. You might mean that you know they actually just don't have the time in the in the universe to deliver their stuff. So then they are like, hey, oh, you want to launch in the US? Here, have some hard drives. Yeah, we have done that one. And I think you here has been from the start. And in the start, they actually sent like hard drives of music with American power sockets. So people had to access solder and like a, build like a converters to make they make them fit to like a, a Swedish power socket, the Euro one, because it's a different voltage and different socket. So yes, every now and then we unfortunately get physical stuff too. Well, physical, <coughs> physical CDs? No, yeah. So the question is, is it 
physical uh, CDs or hard drives. No, we get hard drives and we don't want to get them. So we, if they ask, can we send this to hard, and hard drive, we say no, unless there's a, some really, really good reason for that. So uh, about my former data, uh, I don't know if there is a market for that. I mean, if there is market value in treating classical music in any different way for uh, like metadata, data cleaning, and uh, the searching, and uh, because of the, all of the streaming services I've seen, I, I never seen Spotify. I've been living in Italy, but uh, they all pretty much uh, have a poor selection of or, or poor perceived selection of classical music. And uh, in cleaning data, how, how do you uh, perceive the point of diminishing returns? In, is it like um, some metrics or just management or the customers complaining or like that? Can you, can you repeat the second question? Uh, when you sense uh, that you are uh, at the point of diminishing returns, that enough is enough, that it's clean enough, and uh, you, it doesn't make sense to spend more time in, in cleaning the data. Yeah, so the classical music thing is, uh, for that one first, the classical music kind of, there's a problem with the, uh, even with our model or the model that usually industry views uh, uh, music is that you have artists and in terms of classical music you're not really that interested about artists, you want to know the composer, which is usually the case you're interested in. We, are, we currently get uh, composer data. We have it on databases, but we don't still have it in our clients. But to kind of intermediate solving thing is this for the classical music is that we have an application in, because you can build this like a HTML application in our client. We have an application called Classify, which is from a one big classical music label, and they actually do like manual curation of stuff according composers. But yeah, it would be nice to have the composer search uh, for classical music. And for the Diminishing returns of cleanups. We we tend to do. We want to do as uh, little cleanup as possible. So we would like to push it back to the labels. You know, this is not good data. Please, could you resend it us with the right data? Uh, however, it's not always possible. So we try to match some external sources or do like a crowdsourcing of broken stuff. Uh, but uh, currently, it's not. We are not spending as much time on it as we would like to. Um, you mentioned about uh, constant monitoring the servers and getting statistics of it. Uh, can you explain how you do it and what tools you use for it? We actually use Munin at the moment. So we grasped Munin. Yeah. So we, uh, we have our own statistics like a library that you can just throw in and report stuff to it. And then in the back end, it moves it to a Cassandra storage, which gets upgraded, updated. Uh, and the graphs get updated every five minutes because the munin is, that's the limit of the munin graphing. Uh, we probably will move to something more real time, but that's enough for seeing like uh, latencies of the services, how much network utilization you have, and how's the memory, how much you have this cache, and what's taking part of memory. So yeah, it's munin, like pretty basic stuff. And I have a second question. Uh, do you log every movement, movement of the users? Yeah, so we get hundreds of gigabytes of logs every day. I was going to ask about that. How do yeah. you parse the logs? And we have our own Hadoop cluster, so things go there, and then we run like a hourly Hadoop jobs to get out the play counts and stuff like that. We need to build the top list and so forth. All right, thanks. Hi. First, uh, thanks for the native Linux client. Running the, the normal one in Wine wasn't working great for me. And um, I was thinking about the, the transcoding pipeline. Do you do any interesting signal processing there for uh, normalization or verification of anything? Because, well, I found some stuff. Uh, so this is uh, from uh, a, a single from the fall, and it's the, cell, it's, the last it's the last track. It's called original video in parentheses. So I think that's MPEG data uh, being like used as audio. So yeah. do you have a, a lot of these things? Yeah, we have a lot of lot of that stuff, and it's usually garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. So that because it's a totally automated process, and it probably comes as a VMA file, 
or, uh, so that's why it's like that. And for the audio point of view, uh, we do fingerprinting of the audio for internal purposes, and we do uh, a replay gain on the album level, so to avoid like a huge changes of the audio in the per, service, per single album, but not on multiple albums. Oh yeah, yeah, mood. We now know they also gather mood from the music. Hi. So um, my question is about uh, how do you integrate uh, user feedback tagging and maybe do you do some profiling based on the logs you collect in the classification and uh, machine learning stuff? So, uh, or is it just based on, on the content you receive from the music providers? Uh, most of it's provided on the content that we re receive from different sources. Uh, in terms of like uh, user interactions, we have uh, in our customer support site, we have like a form. Have you, for example, for the ambiguous artists, to find artists that have multiple different artists on the same name, we actually had a form that can, people could report like the album URIs or artist names. And then we just picked that data from there and used it, you, we used that one to train our classifier. Not only is like uh, off, off, offloading our job to someone else, but we also got like a thing that was really related to like what actually people use in music. So we try to improve this, but we can't, on the other hand, we can't just keep on adding more buttons to the client. It, the UI designers would freak out if you would like to have, like if we report this is broken all over the client. Uh, but on the other hand, we also would like to offer the please report stuff and then tell, hey, we fixed this problem that we had. But that's like a future plans. Yeah, but in, in the short follow-up, uh, have you thought about going the last FM way with the tagging? Because uh, they're tagging sometimes miserably fails. We, we actually do kind of, yeah, that would probably uh, make sense, but we kind of, in, in terms of tagging, we use like the genre, we don't trust the genre information that we get from labels or other sources because we, usually you don't get it. So we actually currently figure out genres out of people's playlists. So if someone, people have playlists called grunge and then we just run Hadoop chops on those and think that this music is probably grunge because it's so in so many grunge playlists and so forth. So uh, on the tagging, I don't know, it's, I don't, I don't know the last FM tagging thingy, but I don't know if Yoon has a better answer to the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're not doing it, so not really. Uh, So how do you cope when you get it wrong? So you, you've got this um, thing that looks at the metadata and says, well, I think this is the, the Swedish Kent rather than the Turkish Kent or whatever. And then sometime later, you get reports from users saying this is wrong. Do you, uh, do you have some system to, to later merge the two and say, well, actually, this one isn't Swedish, it's Turkish or whatever? Yeah, so we have this... Uh web app for people working with uh, we, uh, they, they are called the people are called the group is called labor relations so they're people who do like a daily day uh, like interaction with labels and with on the other hand with the customer support to fix problems like this so yeah we have like a web interface for fixing this case where you can go and say split this album to a different artist or merge this artist to different or this album is actually this one so create a redirect from one album to other one and so yeah, we have like a manual curation tool. And we use it to create patches on the data so we don't touch the original data. We have like patches that we keep on applying on the existing data and, and, and hopefully remove the patches at some point when the label fixes stuff or we fix our things to work better. Uh, the last question here. Um, well, it's two questions. One is, um, do you have any radio stations as subscribers to your service? Uh, you know. Well, can you repeat the question? Do you have any radio stations that subscribe to your service for airplay? Uh, no, I think that's like, uh, if you mean like do radio stations play stuff from our service? Right. Uh, no, that's probably not possible due to the licensing. That was my question about the licensing because I wasn't sure if, the, if 
if uh, Warner is sending you things, if you're, how you're keeping track of the royalties. And then uh, that was a question about audio quality because in Switzerland they had the music production network and um, we we're kind of forced to use it from radio stations, but then the audio quality is so bad you couldn't possibly play it <laughs> so on the air. And so that was my question about that. And the second question is, do you, uh, can you take advantage of other databases like Grace Notes or something similar, or Library of Congress databases to check your data, for your metadata? So yeah, we, I, I'll, the quick answer to the latter question is that yes, we, use, uh, we currently use most of the old music guide which provides the biographies and artist pictures for us, and some additional info like uh, when this artist was active that we display in some parts of the client. So yeah, we want to, and we want to use more external databases to get more like uh, secure data. And for the uh, licensing part, what playing stuff, the, the Hadoop jobs we run, they actually collect what people played, and then we have one-to-one -one mapping for those plays to license on a label, and then that produces, again, more like uh, your song scope played this much, but, and this is the amount of money you get, kind of things forward to the, back to the labels then. Uh, and yeah, we, we also have to do like this rights for the music. We have to comply with them to like the local countries like uh, composer right hosen and stuff like that, so we have to also comply with those. So. Okay, um, we are done. Uh, thank you again, Jimmy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, on, on one, yeah, on, uh, tomorrow we have uh, Ask Us Anything session in this same room. So if you have anything you want to ask outside this, you know, anything related to what we do, please come there and shoot us with.